Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower cards catfishes, which are also known as plecos, whiptail catfishes, L numbers, uh, plex, plecostomus within the aquarium trade. Um, and I've also worked in the crime trade. And today I'm going to talk about almost the villain or the scapegoat of the lower card family or of the plecos. And the reason a lot of people maybe are a bit misled about plecos and this group is actually quite misunderstood itself. So I'm going to talk about the common name known as the common pleco. So first I'll define what they are. So the common pleco is a name that common just refers to something that's more frequently seen and it doesn't actually reflect whether it is actually common within a hobby or within an area. It's just a sort of an opinion that people state. You will also see the common bristle nose. This is Ancestrous SP. Uh, we don't know what species it is. Um, it's got tentacles in the males, so maybe smaller to no tentacles in the females they can be somewhat confused but here I'm going to talk about the common pleco so common pleco has more of I think a structured appearance it's not as soft in the head because the common bristle nose which will get confused a bit that has uh, where the tentacles are it doesn't actually have any plating below that so any dermal plating so it's kind of softish which is why um, is kind of a little bit more distinctive. I think it's got a little bit more of a rounder appearance, but there's a lot of variation. So the common, uh, the common pleco, what is it? The common pleco is basically a sort of a pick and mix sometimes. I like to use it, what's known as monophyletically. So kind of um, everything in these two groups are actually the common pleco. So these two groups are hypostomous, which is a massive genus and includes everything from Hypostomus plecostomus uh, to um, uh, what's it, Hypostomus lutus to the Cochidon group, so that's like uh, Cochidon son sonne or Hypostomus sonne. Um, and then also a sister taxa, which is Tereoplichthes, which you're more likely to see than most hypostomus. There are a few hypostomus that appear, and there's some that are seen as more ornamental, like Lutus or Fla uh, Flavius, which is the honeycomb um, species. But Tereoplichthes gets a really bad reputation, and that's the one you're most likely to see. So there's kind of a little bit of an issue with the name Pleco here. Um, Hypostomus plecostomus is the one that you'll see labelled in any dodgy website, any unreliable website, we'll call common pleco Hypostomus plecostomus. But see, that's, it's kind of like, it never actually was in the genus plecostomus. Plecostomus is actually a whiptail catfish, lower caric, these. But Hypostomus plecostomus is pretty rare now. You're rarely, it's, almost unseen. I believe it's originally exported from Suriname, which we rarely get fish from, but they do appear. They just tend not to be as cheap um, for the general hobbyist, but they might be, it might change. The politics of fish exports and imports changes all the time. They just tend to, that sort of area tends to be rarely seen. Um, so generally, I'm talking about the genus Tereoplichthes, and this is actually quite a small genus. I think it's around 15 to 20 species described. And there hasn't been really any new ones in a long time. They are exclusive to South America, but they're, and maybe Central America, but there are invasive populations in North America, particularly in the South, like Florida, also in Africa, potentially some areas in Europe, and also Southeast Asia. But I'm going to argue why just seeing them as invasive doesn't mean that they're not actually great fishers. So, the kind of the fact they're invasive shows they're really adaptable in captivity and they're able to deal with a whole wide of different extremes. This is partially because they actually are fat conserved air breathers. They take in air for, if the water um, oxygen saturation is too low, then they're taking air from the surface itself. Therefore, they're not really as reliant um, on like 
a high amount of flow, which makes them more adaptable for the aquarium, but also means they can be more invasive. I think the argument about invasive species is we should be more responsible about what we're doing with animals that we might not be able to house anymore, rather than just dumping them. And that's the same for botanicals, plants, um, same for any old animal, whether it be dog or cat or um, an animal or plant or anything like that. So Tyriopictes, it's a really diverse um, genus in a way. And you'll see several common names used for various members. They are all still common plecos and you'll see them labelled as such. Common names just depend on who you're talking to. So I count whatever they're called as one of their common names because that's logically how it would work. So you'll see uh, gold spot pleco, that's for Tyriopictes jose and manus. You'll see self in pleco, that's for Tyriopictes jose and manus and gibbyceps. You'll also see ranger pleco, that's for Tyriopictes rabiri and Tyriopictes uh, punctatus. Uh, you'll see there will be other ones, and why? You'll see new ranger pleco. You'll see all sorts of versions of that trying to make it seem like a different species. So this comes into my first myth about um, Tyriopictes or common plecos, and that's size. Yes, there's about 15 species. Um, they're actually really diverse in size. So we've got Webero, which is the ranger pleco. They grow to about 20, 15, 20 centimeter standard length. They're not that big at all. They do grow like weeds, like any other Tyriopictes. They're really adaptable in that sense. Um, like you'll be sure they grow. But they're actually quite small. And then the most common, which is Tyriopictes paudalis, only grows to 30 centimetres standard length. Which comparatively, they get a lot of hate. But Pseudocanthicus, which is the cactus plecos, get to the same size or bigger. And then you've also got Scopinus, it's just the same size ish with a smaller species, Rayona. Ray um, then you've got like, well Pseudocanthicus has a member that has 60 centimeter standard length, so that's double. And then obviously you've got plus the caudal fin, the tail fin. But you've also got the Canthicus which is double, potentially more. And these, and also Panac has species 60 centimeters or more standard length, most of in the 40 centimeter standard length range. And none of these get the hate that Tyriopictes gets. And the reason is probably because a lot of people aren't able to keep these other groups as well as they're able to keep Tyriopictes because Tyriopictes is so adaptable, whereas the other ones tend to die before they get so big. Or most people, like only very few hobbyists, seem to be able to grow out there of the other groups anyway. So. There are other Tyriopictes, so we've got Disjunctivus, that's probably the, one of the larger ones you'll see images of online of the invasive ones. And also Ambrosetti, they're about 40 45 centimetres standard length. And that's also the same for Gibbyceps and Jose Manus. They're um, maybe slightly towards 40 centimetres standard length. So they're not small fishes, but they're not as gigantic as other lower cards. So half of the hate is really unwarranted, and it's basically based on that southern myth that common plecos are common. Firstly, they're kind of getting rarer as we know more about them. They, you are finding still juveniles in stores but it's much less frequent and a lot of stores are refusing to stock them, particularly in the UK. If they do stock them it's uh, adults, they are rehomes. But also you only really see maybe one or two species most often. Usually it's Gibbyceps and Paradalis. You probably do will see Disjunctivus mixed in. Some of them are extremely rare. So Literatus and Panabe. I've I only see maybe one example a year shown online. I don't know if I, I might have seen someone per, in person and I have seen like the type specimen for Panabe and specimens of uh, Literatus. But they aren't that rare. And even with Bearai, it went through a phase where everyone had a ranger pleco, well, quite a few people had them. But they were still rarer than a lot of what people see as um, actually rare. So Literatus is definitely rarer than, well, Hypersistra zebra is a common 
bitch. Therefore, it should really be called one of the common plecos because it's more common than a lot of the common plecos. But half of this hate about them is because they're seen as common, regardless of whether they are actually common. Um, some of the species are really difficult to identify and you don't, because you don't see many examples, it does make them difficult to identify. But it's not about, like, them being cool common plecos has no influence on whether they're common or not. And some are definitely getting rarer. I see much less gibby steps around than I used to. So... It kind of bugs me because people are judging them on the fact they're seeing them as common when you get much... Like L236 is much more common than a lot of the common plecos. Some we never see in captivity, like I think it's Singuensis. That might be it. It's got a Singu in the name. But yeah, so there's a lot more um, rare Arterioplicthes than Hypensistrus, like many of the Hypensistrus. And I guess it's because there's also no enthusiasts really for them, there's little demand, no matter how beautiful some of them are. What's the advantages about Tyrioplicthes? So, I actually think the size is an advantage. So these are larger fishes, um, ranging, so that 15-20 centimetre standard length to 40 centimetre standard length. So not the largest, they're kind of actually medium size. Um, or skirting around medium which is really good if you have a large tank with larger fish because they're going to be able to handle or they're not going to get eaten they might be able to handle other fishes a little bit better than other genera and also the advantage is some are really beautiful like the Snow King, uh, Tyrioplicthes and Vercetti beautiful black white colouring um, really distinctive. Sometimes uh, there is the synonym an anacity that you might see. Otherwise, there's also like Literatus is beautiful, Joseph Manus, even the Gibby Seps. Gibby, adult Gibby Seps look amazing with giraffe like patterning. And I'm not pushing them on people with smaller tanks because I don't, obviously, that's the same. Anyone that says, that, oh, you shouldn't promote them because someone might not have the right tank size, then don't promote anything like Pseudocanthicus, even Barin Sistrus. Most law cards shouldn't be promoted the way they are. So that argument kind of goes a bit null. It's just that people are just judging them based on the fact they're common. But the coloration is so much range. But why... The big advantage is adaptability. This is a really adaptable genus, or some type, hypothesis, it really depends, but I'm focusing on Tyrioplicthes. It's really adaptable. It can withstand and thrive at a wide range of colours. I would go from sort of ideally 21 onwards, uh, like upwards. You could go lower with like short lower ranges. Um, like short term. So I really wouldn't be afraid of them as much as the other ones. A lot of the other larger genera want it much warmer. So Pseudocanthicus 28 degrees minimum. Which, and then Scobin and Sistrus the same. Panac, um, I would go 25, 26 minimum. You could probably go 24 minimum. Um, and then the others, which means that they're kind of in your higher temperature range. And there's a lot of larger fish that people are keeping sort of reaching towards temperate. Which is why Tyrioplicthes is such an advantage um, if you've got a larger tank. They're adaptable to a wide range of water parameters. They can do short term adaptability to salt even, but I wouldn't do that long term. Um, they're just really solid fishes and that's because well we can see that because people are growing them in maybe not ideal conditions and they're la alive whereas a lot of the other larger ones kept with tank busters won't probably make it that long the other thing about Tyrioplicthes is diet so they are detritivores they are albores but they're actually quite generalist and they are really forgiving with it it's not like some which will just um fade away or refuse food if they're given anything else. These guys are just really adaptable. 
and I think they deserve a lot more credit than they're due and people shouldn't look over the rehomes I think is a big thing there's so many needing new homes and they're fully grown or even if they're stunted that after a few years you're pretty much set on the size they're gr gonna grow a little bit slowly over time but you're pretty much set and they're gonna last a good long time they're easier to keep therefore you can have higher welfare standards I think with them and they're not really risking anything I think we should appreciate uh, pseudocanthica um, we should appreciate Tyrioplichthys a lot more than we do they're just beautiful fishes and they're so fascinating the other well the big advantage I would say is some are actually really active a lot of law cars just sit there and hide whereas Tyrioplichthys I notice they do move a lot more so you're more likely to see them they're noted to feed from the surface they're noted to feed anywhere they're just a lot nicer fish for what people are wanting opposed to Pseudocanthicus or Panac or similar it's just I think they're kind of that fish that if you want a rare one they're one that you actually have to know what you're doing to find a rare one because they can be a little bit trickier to find but they're, if you get a rare one they'd be actually really rare so and they'd be hardy as well no different from like Hypostomus luteus really hardy just um, not that common even though they're common in the world but anyway I'll end this video here if you like my videos please comment like and subscribe and goodbye